the message. It's actually level. a little better though today. But it's gonna get up to 30 something. Wow. Yahoo! <laughs> That's like summer in Minnesota. Yeah, That's no right. Kidding. I love it. That's right. Mr. Here. Minnesota's here today. Thanks well, he's filling in for Brian because Brian is laying the wreath down at Andrew Jackson's grave and, and he was at a book tour this weekend. He's down at a diner in Nashville because the president is actually gonna be there, right? His today, favorite Brian? place, Brian. We know you love diners. Good morning. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, a couple uh, a couple of things. Uh, hey Pete. Uh, a couple of things. It's just ironically, Gretchen Wilson was at John Rich's birthday party, and you know that he's, they like Ainsley as well as Steve better than me, but I was at a chance, just our, our paths cross, and Gretchen Wilson was there live. She is, what, and that's who you just bumped in yeah. with. Mm -hmm. She's one of the best voices I ever heard. But I digress. We were at the Pancake Pantry, okay. beautiful area, Hillsborough Village. Right now, Steve, I know you like to see what the town looks like. We're nestled between Vanderbilt well, I like to see what they're having for Belmont, breakfast. You know? And, and by the way, the president's going to be here about three o'clock, right. and he's going to be talking about reviving uh, uh, prosperity in the rural co rural areas. Making Sonny farming great again. Us live in 45 minutes. But yeah, that's what I hear. So this is a little dark, but this is such a cool town. It's about a few miles outside Nashville, but it's actually somewhat normal. It was 28 degrees yesterday. There's Vanderbilt right down there. Belmont's just over my shoulder. Look at this great town here. And the Pancake Pantry, been around for Look 50 years. A legendary and spot. A new in owner Nashville. has just taken over, and they're already feeling. They, they say 100 people are moving to Nashville a day, and the place is, is booming. And it, check this out as an incentive. A lot of folks. We have this just arrived this morning, a lot of people coming. And as an incentive to come down, we have Ainsley Herhart's book. This is based on a true story, right, Ainsley? <laughs> That's right. And then we also. For the first 25 people, morning's better with friends. You'll have your choice if you're in the military. Wait, wait, wait. Get, so uh, if, Jackson, if people are Williams. watching right now and they come to the Pancake Pantry, they're going to wind up with a free copy That's of your book and yeah. get to Signed meet you. Signed copies. Right. And Ainsley signed them and sent some down as well. So we're going to be doing that, meeting some everyday people, find out how they feel about the president coming here for the second time since he's okay. president. Also, the impact of this book. And a lot of people are looking at the tax plan and how it affects rural communities. We're going to also have some state officials here, community bank experts, and uh, they're going to be talking about how this tax plan and this economy affects them here in one of the fastest growing Fantastic. cities in America. And it's going to be exciting because, remember, Bob Corker's calling it quits. There's going to be a battle here for the Senate seat. So everyone is pretty tapped into what's going on for the midterm Right, this is a serious breakfast with friends upgrade. Yeah. I mean, you're really showing us up here. <laughs> <laughs> well, All just right. put it this way, Pete. Just don't let me down with Herschel Walker and Brian Mast, Alan Dershowitz, Done. and everybody else, okay? I'll do the uh, best I can. He won't the best let you I down. Can. And Brian, are you going to watch the game tonight? Alabama versus Georgia? It's going to be a yeah. good one. Great weekend of football over the weekend, especially here at the Tennessee Titans won. The place is still celebrating. But I will be watching tonight, and the president's going tonight. Also, there's right. some protests and some supporters are going to be battling it out. So there's nothing ever, there's no, there's no quiet day in America anymore. <laughs> Always exciting. And football finally has a final. All right. So Good if stuff. folks are watching right now, they're near the Pancake Pantry going down. Uh, say hello to Brian, get a book, and uh, maybe be on TV. That's right. right. Brian will Love the name, bit, Pancake Pantry. He was mentioning that the president's going to be in Nashville. He's speaking to the American Farm Bureau Federation yep. Convention. It's the 99th. Um, convention that they've had, and they've invited the sitting president every single year. This is the first time in 25 years mm. a president, a sitting president, has said yes to that invitation. That's right. The last one to go was uh, President George Herbert Walker Bush, and the farmers, uh, you know, they understand that the president realizes the challenges facing them these days. They said uh, the president made it very clear farmers would have a seat at his table, so they saved him a seat at the mm -hmm. podium, and he's going to address some well, of big today. issues like deregulation that farmers mm -hmm. have faced. You talk about the estate tax, which hits That's farmers big. a lot. He'll probably talk about a lot of that from his tax reform bill. So reasons why he's going to rural America to say, when I talk about the forgotten man, I right. remember you. And that's yeah. part of today. 7,000 farmers will be there at this convention. You know, uh, today was going to be the day that the President of the United States was going to unveil his hashtag fake news awards, yeah. where fake, faker, <laughs> fakiest, fakest. I can't wait. I know. Well, I he's, he's put it off till next week because there's a lot to do. Uh, and no doubt uh, he's considering 
giving Michael Wolf an award for his book that came out because we have heard that, uh, you know, since then, apparently this is a reporter who has used some unscrupulous methods in the past. But one of the themes in the mainstream media has been there are so many people who are working at the White House, working for this president, his aides, who just think he is a nincompoop. He's in over his head. But you know what? The people who actually work with the president were on television this weekend defending him, and they don't sound anything like that. My personal experience, I was with the president yesterday at Camp David. I'm with him almost every day. The president is engaged. He, he understands the complexity. He asks really difficult questions of our team at CIA so that we can provide him the information that he needs to make good informed policy decisions. I work with the president and speak with him multiple times a week. This is a man, he didn't become the president by accident. Was he unstable when, unstable when he passed the tax reform? Was he unstable when we finally hit back at Syria and said no more chemical weapons? Was he unstable when we finally put North Korea on notice? He's different than any other politician. I can tell you he's got the wherewithal to do things that no politician's been able to do, um, and in a good way. Contrast these statements, especially from a Rand Paul, who was no ally of the mm -hmm. president to begin with, with anonymously sourced, you know, sort of gossip right. that this, this book is, is trafficking. It's a very different story. The problem is, is that trafficking and gossip feeds a narrative that so many people in the left-wing media want to believe. Yeah, watch this. Here's an example. He not only amplifies the coverage of this, but he also amplifies the questions that the book raises. We could look back a year from now and say the warning signs were there and we did not do enough. When you hear him put out that tweet, stable genius, it's kind of like Richard Nixon, I'm not a crook. It raises serious questions about his, his, his mental capacity, his ability to process mm -hmm. information, his impulse control. If this book is to be believed, and I think it is credible, then it is actually quite frightening for the American people. He is like a child. I think we've probably all written this 500 times. <laughs> It's interesting. There, uh, so the media goes mental. That's the headline right there. Uh, there are stories, you know, in the book reported, and I haven't read it yet, uh, but I've seen news reports that say that there are people who work in the West Wing who talk, you know, they'll hear the president say something and they'll go, oh, we got to think about the 25th Amendment where the vice president and the cabinet, they essentially have a vote down in the basement. They say, okay, he's got to go, and then they take over. So, Michael Wolf says they do that all the time. So thanks, uh, George Stephanopoulos, for raising serious questions about his mental capacity because he's got the qualification for that. Former Clinton staffer, then you've got liberal Joy Reid, then you've got never Trumper David Brooks. I mean, this is the people who have always hated the president using the latest tool that they have at their disposal, which is mental capacity based on a, mm -hmm. a terribly sourced book. They went from, they went to obstruction, they went to collusion. Now they're trying mental capacity and uh, we'll see how long they, they push it. Yeah. And, how, and it really is, but it is very dangerous. They've done, they did it to uh, Barry Goldwater. They did it to Ronald Reagan. They did. They did it to George W. Bush. Now they're trying to do it to President Trump because the liberal media hates conservatives. I'm noticing, I'm noticing a theme. Just Republicans. <laughs> That's mm -hmm. right. Right. Well, Professor Alan Dershowitz was on the show yesterday, and he was talking about how he didn't vote for him, but he says no. this is the same guy today as he was on the campaign trail. Nothing's changed. Listen. There's only one thing worse than trying to criminalize political differences, and that's trying to psychiatrize them. These psychiatrists now who are trying to diagnose without ever having met the man, how dare liberals, people on the left, try to undo democracy by accusing a president of being mentally ill without any basis. The 25th Amendment doesn't apply. Everybody knew who Donald Trump was when they elected him. And this idea of diagnosing him instead of opposing him politically poses an enormous danger. You know, you use the word gossip. Alone. You use the word gossip. That's mm -hmm. exactly what it is. It is tabloid news, reading a book of some guy's account who's now bashing the president after he was fired. Now he's apologizing, and they're using that as, as the, as the tell-all book. It's, it's, it's like the Bible to them. Yes. And it is just gossip, and it is... You know, and it's, it happens on both sides. Every time there's a Democrat and someone writes a book about what's happening inside yeah. and Republicans go crazy about it, and now the same thing is happening with this guy who leaves the White House sure. and writes a book about the Republican president. Democrats love it. Mainstream media loves it. Yeah. But it's, who but really if knows? the mainstream media wants their credibility back, why are they relying on a terribly sourced book to try yeah, to get okay. the credibility back? You know, the other thing is, uh, because Donald Trump was such a tight organization when he was running for president, he's had to include people who are on his permanent staff at the White House who were part of the swamp. And sure. I have no doubts that they did talk to Michael Wolf. And they yeah. probably said a lot of this stuff thinking it was off the record or whatever. But here's a message to the people who are working at the White House and who feel that way or say those things behind the president's back. 
Just quit your job. If you're not yeah. happy, you're not <laughs> yes. completely on board with the president's message, get out of the White House. Why would you do it? Why point. would you say one thing during the day and then uh, over uh, cocktails at the Hay Adams, why would you say something else? Mm -hmm. Quit your job. Move on. Good there point. are lots of jobs with DC. Plenty of options. Great yeah. point, Steve. Good point. All right. All right, let's hand it over to Jill. You know, has some headlines for us. Good morning. Good Monday Good morning, morning, guys. Monday Steve morning. Home as well. We do begin with some breaking news and a Fox News alert. Sheriff's deputy in Washington state was killed while responding to a suspected home invasion. The Pierce County Sheriff's Office says the deputy was shot by a man during a foot chase in Fredericksen. That's about 40 miles south of Seattle. One suspect on the loose at this hour. Another suspect was found dead. No word yet on how he died, but we will keep you updated. New York's JFK Airport, one of the nation's busiest, reopening a closed international terminal after a massive water main break. Hundreds of flights already behind schedule from the winter storm that shut down much of the East Coast, delayed or canceled anyway last week. Patients running thin. Port Authority officers had to break up a crowd of angry passengers. And if that wasn't enough, wings from two international planes colliding on the tarmac. SpaceX launching a secret satellite into space as its first flight of the year. Three, two, one. Ignition, liftoff. The Zuma aircraft taking off from Cape Canaveral, but not revealing its mission for the U.S. government. The first stage booster landed back on Earth minutes later as part of SpaceX's effort to build reusable rockets. The NFL playoffs heating up. The New Orleans Saints clamping down on their division rival, beating the Carolina Panthers 31 to 26. In Jacksonville, the Jaguars holding the Buffalo Bills to just a field goal for a 10 to 3 victory. Their first playoff win in a decade. Former Bill O.J. Simpson, who lives in Las Vegas, taking in the game at a bar with some diehard fans. Just take a look. One lucky fan happened to be wearing a The Juice is Loose t-shirt with a picture of the infamous white Ford Bronco. The Hall of Famer released from prison on parole in October. He played for the Bills from 1969 to 1977. So look at your headlines, guys. Pete, I know you and I are both going to be closely watching games this weekend. We will. My Vikes are going to play the Saints. We'll see if your Eagles can make it out. We'll uh, see. The Falcons, the Falcons are looking Falcons, dangerous. Well, they are looking right. pretty good. And tonight, the big Alabama-Georgia game. Yep. College. Sure. College <laughs> Love football. It. All right. Thanks, Jillian. Thanks, Jillian. Meanwhile, thousands of companies jumping on the Trump tax train, offering workers big bonuses and pay increases. Our next guest just added his company to the list. Why? We'll talk to him live. And one drunk driver called the police on himself. The address of your emergency? I don't know. I'm too drunk. I don't know where I'm at. Oh, man. The rest of that 911 call, there's his picture coming up. <laughs> The Republican tax plan was a win for many Americans, especially employees at the companies offering bonuses, pay raises, and other benefits as a direct result of President Trump's tax reform bill. There on the screen, some of the companies giving out bonuses. Aquesta Bank just joined that growing list over the weekend, and joining us right now is Aquesta CEO Jim Engel. Jim, uh, you're a banking business, Aquesta. It started in your basement 11 years ago, what, and now you're a, a big multi uh, hundreds of millions of dollar operation. Why did you want to give your employees bonuses after this? Well, Steve, uh, the Tax Reform Act is great for our um, shareholders, but it's also great for our um, customers. And we really wanted to uh, directly share that with our employees. Uh, we would not have grown from basically a, a concept 11 years ago to $400 million today without just great employees. And because of that, uh, when the Tax Reform Act was passed, we wanted to share those benefits uh, with, uh, with our employees. And I understand because uh, you as a business are gonna have more money in your pockets, you're actually going to uh, hire some more people as well, right? Well, exactly. Uh, we, we figured this is gonna be a, a pretty um, good savings for us. We are, uh, even though we're 400 million in assets, that's actually very small for banking. Uh, we're considered a community bank and this allows us to continue to expand. Uh, we've been growing, Aquesta has been growing about 20% a year and uh, at some point you, you start needing capital. Right. And the tax savings that we get from this allow us to expand even further. Uh, make more loans, which means hiring more people. So Absolutely. we expect to hire 
uh, a good number of people over the coming year. Well, that's terrific. Uh, that's great. I think that's what uh, the presidents and the, Repu the president and the Republicans intended. But Jim, I heard from a number of uh, Democrats. They said this uh, this tax cut thing was just going to be a giveaway to the rich. Doesn't sound like a lot of rich people are going to wind up with that at your company. Now um, we actually don't have any rich people at our company. Uh, we, it, again, we're very small, uh, starting in the basement and moving up from there in seven branches now. But uh, the money that we're going to be able to save in taxes will directly allow us to increase the amount of lending we do. Sure. We figure this is about an additional $9 million of lending a year, which uh, in our small towns, uh, will help new businesses Absolutely. grow or actually even form. Surely. And, of course, your employees are going to get, wind up with $1,000 bonuses, and everybody's going to have at least $15 an hour for the minimum wage. Uh, Jim Engel joining us today from Charleston. Thank you very much for sh sharing the good word with your company. Thank you. Well, thank you for having me. Really appreciate it. All right. Have a good day. All right. Uh, meanwhile, on this Monday, we've heard a lot of names thrown around for possible 2020 presidential candidates. But last night at the Golden Globes, Oprah's name entered the fray. And that's Ivanka Trump on the right. Do you know who is on the left? Here's a hint. His mother probably won't be happy. Welcome back. Some quick headlines for you. What if Donald Trump had never run for president? Well, outgoing New Jersey Governor Chris Christie thinks he would be occupying 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue instead. Telling NewJersey.com in an exit interview as he leads the governorship, he said, it's incredibly frustrating to think to yourself, wow, if this guy were not in the race, we would win this thing. Interesting take. And Nancy Pelosi's son is quite the nonpartisan partier. Paul Pelosi Jr. posting this photo on Instagram, hamming it up with Ivanka Trump at the president's New Year's Eve Mar-a-Lago bash. While the post has since been deleted, can't be showing that kind of bipartisanship, no. But his sister says he may have just been there to play golf. It's all just a misunderstanding. Ainsley, over to you. Okay, thanks so much. Hollywood elites have a new message. Don't call them Hollywood elites. Listen. This looks like a room of privileged Hollywood elite, and that's fair. But everyone in this room knows that Hollywood is so much more than that. When you're on a film set, you meet hairdressers and camera people and script supervisors. Most of the jobs on film sets are jobs for people who work long, hard hours. They are American dream jobs. Those people aren't there thanks to their rich dad, except for that one PA. People in this room worked really hard to get here, but it's clearer now than ever before that the women had to work even harder. Here to react is comedian Chad Prather. Chad, what'd you think about that? Well, Ainsley, before we get into that, let me just say, go dogs! Our SEC <laughs> is playing in the national championship tonight. Well, I'll be watching. I, you yeah. know, I, it, I, well, I'll be there. I will watch that. I can't say that I watched the Golden Globes so much, but uh, you know, this, this, everything, everything Seth Meyer says is gospel truth, right? We, we know that's got to be a fact. <laughs> Those aren't the people that we're referring to as Hollywood elite when we use that term. What we are talking about are people like Oprah who want to get up there, and people like Meryl Streep. Who, who attend, you know, they want to take this moral high ground and preach to the rest of America about what's right and wrong. And, you know, these political award shows, they used to be about the award winners. They're not anymore. Now they're, they're you know, it's kind of like the band playing on the deck of the Titanic as the ship sinks. Uh, because the, these guys, they know that this whole deal is, is falling on deaf ears in a big way. I think that the that basically the pointy head executives in Hollywood got together and said, how can we salvage this whole thing? Well, let's come out. Let's talk about women's empowerment. Let's talk about how we're really not elite. Let's talk about how, you know, we, we're the persecuted bunch. And I don't think anybody in America truly believes anyone in Hollywood is, is, is the persecuted group. <laughs> yeah, they've got a lot of money in their bank accounts, don't they? Okay, so Seth, Seth talks about in his opening monologue, he, he mentions back in 2011, he said at the White House Correspondents' Dinner that President Trump wasn't qualified to become president. They and you fast forward, obviously, we know what, what happens. So then he looks at Oprah and he says, so Oprah, you will never be president. You do not have what it takes. So then NBC, they, they go on social media and they do nothing but respect for our future president. Hashtag Golden Globes with a picture of Oprah. So NBC not being objective here. Look at this. A little bizarre for them to put that up there. What were your thoughts? Well, maybe she'll one day be president of NBC, but she's not going to be president of the United <laughs> States. Now, I know a lot of people said the same thing about Donald Trump, but let's face it. 
Uh, we're talking about a huge, huge difference. And, and look, with all due respect to Oprah, with all due respect for her speech for empowerment of women and young girls and everything that she said, let's be real here. Donald Trump has enjoyed an unprecedented first year as president. He has. You, you can't argue the track record. And so, you know, this idea of continually getting up and using uh, these award platforms as a political way to share your opinions and your views and even predict the future, it goes over about as well as Barack Obama giving a keynote speech at the NRA convention. It just rings a little hollow. All right, Chad Prather, thanks for joining us this morning. Go dogs. And go dogs. Okay, roll tide. I like them both. I can't wait to watch. Bye. Thank you. Democrats slamming President Trump's crackdown on immigration must have forgotten about when President Clinton said this. We are still a nation of immigrants. We should be proud of it. We are also a nation of laws. Dan Bongino didn't forget, and he's going to join us live next. And President Trump heads to Nashville today, but Brian is already there with some of our friends. He's having breakfast with many of them. Today, President Trump is visiting Nashville for the second time since becoming president to outline his economic roadmap for rural America in his first big policy address since tax reform passed. So what do the folks think? Brian Kilmeade has been talking to them. He's live at the Pancake Pantry in Nashville, where he's got a round table, actually a rectangular table with some folks <laughs> who are going to talk taxes. Brian. Yeah, absolutely. So a lot of people are wondering here in Nashville in particular, uh, a booming community that has a very low state tax. How does the tax plan at the federal level affect the people in the community level? Half suburban, half rural, about 25 miles outside Nashville is Steerstone Bank. These are the executives there, which means the bank is not open. They have the keys. Uh, these are the McDonald's, uh, Bob and Bob, uh, Bob Sr., Bob Jr., uh, Susan McDonald, as well as John Bryan. So before they start their day, they're usually on the treadmill. They decide to come down and talk to us. Cedar Stone Bank, the ultimate community bank, the president passes this big tax bill. And I asked you, you know, how did it affect you? And what is your reaction? Yeah, big impact, Brian. Whatever is good for our customers is good for our company. So when this tax law changed and we had lower taxes, less government in our lives, more money in our pocket, it helped all of our customers, whether it's individuals or businesses. But in what way, guys, uh, and Susan, how does it affect you? In terms of numbers, have you hired more? you given out incentives? Are you going to be lending more? Well, we'll be doing all of that. Uh, we expect, Brian, that this tax uh, change will impact our bank's bottom line by about $250,000. So we'll take that money. We're going to put it right back in our uh, community. We're going to hire more people. We're going to uh, put, we're going to uh, sponsor more baseball teams, and we're going to make more donations. Right. And, Johnny, you also, uh, you guys do know the community. You're a bank that knows people around. They all come down, whether it's a nonprofit or it's a person looking to expand their home. So will this, will this enable you to do more? Oh, absolutely. You know, um, banking's all about relationships, and uh, part of our job is to uh, educate the customers and uh, try to uh, uh, let them know that this new uh, tax law is good for them. Uh, there's a lot of uh, miscommunication out there uh, that it's only for the rich, and that's that's wrong. We see uh, where it's going to impact uh, the smallest of customers and the largest customers. Wow! So, so Cedar Stone Bank is going to be pouring it back in to the community. No doubt. If our uh, community is successful, our bank is successful, and this tax change will do that. All right. Now, by the way, this has been torture. I said you cannot touch the breakfast <laughs> until after the segment. And by the way, great job here at uh, the Pancake Pantry presenting all this. Now, the good news is, guys, not only you go back to work, but you can have your breakfast. We're we going to do it. All right. All right. <laughs> Thanks so much. Back to you guys in the studio. We're going to be back with the Secretary of Agriculture, Sonny Purdue, in just a moment. He is just nestling in behind us. Okay, very busy there at the pantry. It's All right, Brian, thank the you. The Pancake Pantry, what a cute name. All right, uh, meanwhile, let's bring in Dan Bongino. He's a former New York City cop. Uh, he was a Secret Service agent. He's the host of the Dan Bongino Show. He joins us today from Florida. Good morning to you. Good morning. Good morning. Hey, good morning. Good to be here. It's good to have you. Uh, Dan, uh, over the weekend at Camp David, apparently the idea of, of a welfare reform came up. Paul Ryan really would like to see... Uh, the country do something about entitlements because it is such a big chunk of change. 52 cents on every dollar goes to entitlement, so-called entitlements. Apparently he wants it. 
Uh, Mitch McConnell on the other side says, not time for it. And it sounds like the president is just saying, eh, we'll see. Right now, that's not my top priority. What do you think? You know, Steve, th this is a ground ball argument for the Republicans. Listen, most people in the United States have no problem with some form of government. I'd rather it be at the local level, but some form of government providing a backstop for people who are genuinely in hard times. Right. That polls relatively well. Let me tell you what doesn't poll relatively well. Having the government provide a hammock for you for the rest of your life, for your phone, your rent, food, anything else you need. Listen, Steve, there are people working really hard right now to unload a lot of money to support a mammoth-sized government. If you're going to take money from that government, the, at the very least, there should be drug testing, there should be time limits on it. If you are able-bodied, you should work. People work for a living. This is really hard. We're in a relatively hot economy. You have to find a job eventually. And incentivizing people to not find a job by paying them to not work is utterly outrageous. Yeah. And I have a bunch of personal examples of yeah, that. Yeah, Dan, I wanted you to talk about that because it was created to put to allow people to kind of get back on their feet. Take a few months, look for a job, get back on your feet if you are an able body, um, someone who's able to work. Tell us your sure. mother-in-law story. You've been on our show before, and it's pretty powerful. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, she's an incredible woman. And, uh, you know, I never like telling this story because I always get a little choked up when I do it. But she's a, she came here as an immigrant from Colombia and with nothing, Ainsley, zero, like no money at all, spoke no English. She works her butt off cleaning planes. She takes the airplane peanuts from the plane to give to the kids for food. She mm. used to sleep on the mattress with one mattress with her three uh, children, my, my wife obviously being one of them at the time, like heads, tails. And why do I tell you that? Because she could hear my wife's stomach at night growling mm. and she'd tell me it was the most painful thing she ever heard. But you know what she did? She took the opportunity of America not the check from America, and she ran with it. She is now one of the most amazingly successful women I've ever met in my entire life. She's a homeowner. She has a nice income she's provided for herself. You know why? She committed to the American dream, mm -hmm. not a check from the American taxpayer early on. I just wish we would embrace that more as a country, the idea of opportunity, mm -hmm. not the idea of providing people a check as a way out of opportunity. It's nonsense. Absolutely. Well, the, the power of legal immigration has been has, has fed this country forever, people striving to come here. Well, the, the challenge of illegal immigration has existed for many, many decades. And as we talk about a potential deal on Capitol Hill, the Democrats want DACA, the president wants his wall. As we look at this deal, well, we, we, we rolled some videotape. It turns out people, when people say things, it lives forever. And it, the Democrats were for the wall before they were against it. Listen to Bill Clinton in 1996 and Senator Obama in 2006. Tonight, I announce I will sign an executive order to deny federal contracts to businesses that hire illegal immigrants. Let me be very clear about this. We are still a nation of immigrants. We should be proud of it. We are also a nation of laws. It will authorize some badly needed funding for better fences and better security along our borders. Yes, we need tougher border security and stronger enforcement measures. Yes. We need more resources for customs and border agents and more detention beds. Dan, sounds a lot like Donald Trump. What I'm confused. Changed? Yeah. What changed? <laughs> you, you, yeah, well, well, what changed? What changed is the Democrats committed to an antagonist strategy post in the post-Clinton era. And let's, be, let's just be candid about this right now. Immigration for the Democrats post-Clinton has never, ever been about compassion or helping immigrants. It has always been about raw political power and votes. They believe demographics is destiny. They need people to replace the dying middle-class voters that they're losing that have moved over to the Trump-type uh, candidates and, uh, and, and Republicans who represent the working class, and they need to replace them with immigrants that they can get on the government dole. That is all this is about, and I can prove it to you. When they put poison pills in these immigration documents, the Republicans, and they say things like, listen, we'll let people in the country as immigrants, but they can't vote for a certain period of time if right. they come here illegally. The Democrats say no every time. Dan, exit question. Does Donald Trump ultimately get the wall or part of the wall? I'll tell you what. If he picks a hill to die on, this is the one. This is unbelievably popular with the American people. I think he gets it. And if the Democrats want to shut down the government over it, Good luck with that in the 2018 midterms. All right. He's joining us today Good from point. the uh, warmer than we're at state of Florida. Mm -hmm. Dan, thank, thank you Dan. very Thanks, much. Thanks, Dan.
All right, well, Jillian Mealy's got a few additional headlines for us. That's right. Good morning, Good morning. you guys. Let's get you caught up on some of your news of the day, starting with this. Police are desperately searching for a missing college football reporter who vanished after sending a terrifying text. Friends say Courtney Faye Rowland, who covers Texas A&M football for the website Rivals, sent her roommate a text message early Sunday morning claiming she was being followed home from a Walgreens by a suspicious man in a blue truck. The 29-year-old former colleague says she was spotted in Uptown Houston Sunday afternoon. Her car, purse, wallet, and phone were found in the area. President Trump being met with more than just sports fans as he heads to Atlanta for the college football championship game. The NAACP calling on fans to protest with signs and bring white towels to the game to create a, quote, wave simulating a blizzard while the president is in the packed stadium. Trump supporters mockingly call the opposition snowflakes, but when we come together, we create a mighty storm. Another group promising to take a knee in solidarity with pro athletes who protest the national anthem. Well, this man certainly making an officer's job way too easy, calling 911 on himself for driving drunk. One, what's the address of your emergency? I don't know. I'm too drunk. I don't know where I'm at. Where'd you been all night? Um, driving around, trying to get pulled over, actually. Your last name, sir? Uh, uh, I think I'm going to go get something to eat. They can catch up with me. Huh. Officers charging Michael Lester with a DUI, the 39-year-old admitting to swallowing meth and not sleeping for four days. Our incredible Fox & Friends viewers showing their generosity to help victims of a devastating fire. New York City's deadliest fire in more than 25 years, claiming its 13th victim this last week. Fox News religion contributor Father Jonathan Morris joined us yesterday on Fox & Friends asking for your help. The families are waiting outside my door saying, I need help. I, I, I haven't worked. These are people, like you said, poorest congressional districts in the United States of America, in the South Bronx. They're not working because they're taking care of their families and they're spread out in shelters all over the city. It's a very serious situation and, and we need help. Well, how about it? Father Morris's GoFundMe page now stands at more than $164,000, that money going directly to the displaced families. If you want to donate, all you have to do is head to foxandfriends.com. That's a look at your headlines. I'll send it back to you guys. All right, Jillian, yeah. thank you very much. Thanks. We highlighted that over the weekend and the generosity of the viewers, as you know. Yeah.